These past few weeks in our <clears throat> messages, we've been following the theme of epic meltdowns. A couple weeks ago, we read the book of Job, part of the book of Job, about this meltdown of Job's life where everything wrong happened and it wasn't his fault. Everything fell apart. Last week, we read the story from the book of Daniel about Nebuchadnezzar who had a meltdown of his own making, in a way, but through which came his healing. And having looked at kind of those individual meltdowns today, we want to tackle an even more difficult topic when relationships melt down. So we're going to be reading today from the book of Galatians in chapter 2 verses 11 through 21, about kind of an argument, a meltdown between um, Peter, or Cephas in this reading, um, and Paul. So will you hear today the word of God from Galatians chapter 2, verses 11 through 21. But when Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face, because he stood self-condemned. For until certain people came from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. But after they came, he drew back and kept himself separate for fear of the circumcision of faction. And the other Jews joined him in this hypocrisy, so that even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. But when I saw that they were not acting consistently with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas before them all, if you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you compel the Gentiles to live like Jews? We ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners. Yet we know that a person is justified not by the works of the law, but through faith in Christ Jesus. And we have come to believe in Christ Jesus so that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by doing the works of the law because... No one will be justified by the works of the law. But if in our effort to be justified in Christ, we ourselves have been found to be sinners, is Christ then a servant of sin? Certainly not. But if I build up again the very things that I once tore down, then I demonstrate that I am a transgressor. For through the law I died to the law, so that I might live to God. I have been crucified with Christ. And it is no longer I who live, but it is Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not nullify the grace of God, for if justification comes through the law, then Christ died for nothing. This is the word of God for us, God's people. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Lord God, we thank you for your Son, Jesus Christ. We thank you for faith in him, which makes us whole again. We thank you, God, of relationship with us. Bless us now as we meditate on your word. May we know and understand your presence with us to heal ourselves, to heal our relationships, to heal our world. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Amen. Relationships are central to our Christian faith. After all, we talk about having a personal relationship with God through Jesus Christ. We talk about how important and pivotal that is to be in relationship with God and through Jesus Christ to have our relationship with God set right again. We live out our faith in relationship with each other, knowing each other and building together life. And isn't that what life is made up of? Relationships. Relationships with one another in our family, romantic relationships, relationships with friends and co-workers and neighbors. There are so many relationships that comprise our lives. And we all know, we've all experienced from time to time that sometimes those relationships that we value, that love, that we feel, those things that make them so great can often make it so painful when relationships melt down. 
And those meltdowns can be big or small. They can be meltdowns that end the whole relationship. They can be meltdowns that are arguments over things that will be resolved. There are all sorts of meltdowns. And thank God that the Bible doesn't shy away from them because we're people and this is life. The Bible doesn't present us with the heroes of faith, the people like Peter and Paul as sugar-coated heroes who never do anything wrong and always get along. The Bible is not rainbows and kittens and unicorns and everybody's always happy, but it's real life. Real life where relationships can melt down. And so as we read this story today, as we meditate on all of these things, I just want to give a little bit of a disclaimer, right? Like, this is a big, heavy topic. We've had a lot of big, heavy topics lately in church. But if we don't talk about those things in church, if we can't talk about those things in church, we'll be looking somewhere else for those answers, right? And there's no way in a 20-minute sermon to talk about all the possible things that could melt down in relationships or how we might go about fixing that or responding to that, right? The Bible is what we need, but the Bible doesn't always give us what we want, right? The Bible isn't some sort of manual that we can just open up and flip to the page and the section on the sort of problem we're dealing with right now and read about how exactly we ought to to resolve the problem, right? So today, there are lots of things that can be afoot in relationship meltdowns, and I can't point you to a Bible verse that says exactly what to do, you know, when you realize that your family member is more than just a little crazy, they're a sociopath, I don't have a Bible verse to point you towards to that. I don't have a Bible verse to point you towards exactly what to do when you figure out that your significant other has been hiding an addiction from you that could turn your lives upside down. I don't have an exact Bible verse to point you towards on that. There are a lot of serious things that can happen, and we're not going to come up with all the answers in 20 minutes. But the Bible does give us, if not what we want, the Bible does give us what we need a space to hear from God, stories that inspire us and move us, principles that we can live by, things that can get us thinking a God who we can seek to find the answer we need with what to do next. So let's look then at Peter and Paul and the little meltdown that they have and we read about in Galatians here. Really, it's a meltdown between Peter and Paul and James and Barnabas and the whole Christian crew gathered there in Antioch and beyond. One of the central themes in the book of Acts, if you read the book of Acts, about the early church is them coming to a resolution about what to do with this question that's on everybody's mind. Jesus was a Jew, but what about all the people who aren't Jews? To become Christians, do they have to become Jews first? Do they have to follow all of the Jewish laws with their dietary restrictions and their details about what to do in every part of life to become a Christian? Do the Gentiles and non-Jewish people, do they have to become Jewish first and follow all the rules? And in Acts, we read about how, with God's help, the early church comes to an answer on this. Peter has to see a vision from heaven. Paul has to get knocked off of his horse. They have to talk about it and have the hard conversations with each other, but eventually they understand that the Holy Spirit is leading them to the point where the Gentiles and the non-Jewish people who come to believe in Jesus don't have to follow all the Jewish laws. They don't have to become Jewish first. And thanks be to God for that, right? For most of us are Gentile Christians And we can celebrate that with some ham and some bacon and some other things prohibited in those Jewish dietary laws. They come to a resolution on this and they all agree on it. This is where we ought to be headed, or they mostly agree on it. They know that this is God's leading. So when Paul encounters in Antioch that Peter has backtracked on this, that he's stopped eating with the Gentiles just to keep some other people happy who want to see things the way 
that they were. Paul is not happy. Paul is not happy because this has the potential to break down all the relationships in the church between Jew and Gentile, between people. Peter backtracks. He's doing something different, trying to please other people. It's often where we get in trouble in our relationships, right? When we try to please other people at some other people's expense, where we try to do something that will make everybody happy and we know that everybody can't be happy when we go back on our word about what we said we would do. Relationships get messy and they're messy here for Peter and Paul and the early church. Now I wasn't there in Antioch a couple thousand years ago, despite what my kids say, I'm not quite that old. Um, so I don't know about how Paul goes about this, calling Peter out in front of everybody. I don't know about that, but I do know that it's good and right that Paul is willing to have the hard conversation about this, right? Paul is willing to have the hard conversation with Peter about this thing that has the potential to tear everything down, to exclude other people, to break down relationships. Paul is willing to have the hard conversation about what is wrong in the relationship. And so often, brothers and sisters, in our culture, in our society today, a lot of times we are unwilling to have the hard conversations, aren't we? We make assumptions about what the other person is thinking or feeling or why they did what they did or what this means or what their thinking is behind it, and we just give up rather than investing in the relationship and trying to have the hard conversations. But Paul and Peter, even if it's a little dramatic, have the hard conversation, and it appears that they work things out, and the church works things out, and they can move forward. Now, I told you that the Bible's not full of exactly what to do in every situation and I can't tell you what to do in every situation but in so many situations in our relationships in our lives in the church in our friendships so often it comes down to being willing to have the hard conversations to talk about the things that need to be talked about to see where the other person is feeling and thinking, to understand where they're coming from and why they did what they did and how they feel about it now. Having the hard conversation is so important, and it is what Paul does here. And after Paul kind of forces the hard conversation, after he has that hard conversation and he's talking about it here in Galatians to understand how to have a relationship Paul goes from there back to the foundational relationship of them all, our relationship with God. Did you notice that? Paul is talking in this passage about this meltdown that happens publicly with Peter, but then after that he goes to talking about the very basics of our relationship with God, the fundamental doctrines, the doctrine of salvation, reminding us that we are saved by faith in Christ Jesus, not by our works, not by our laws, not by getting all the things in order, not by our culture or our tradition or pleasing people, not by the law existing, but by grace in Jesus Christ, by what God has done for us in Jesus. Hmm. So we may not have the manual that says, if then, do this in a relationship. But I think Paul here points us to some more helpful things. That when we're worried about our relationships and what to do next, that we start with our primary relationship, our relationship with God. What does God model for us in God's relationship with us, with humanity, in Jesus Christ, that we can learn from and practice in our relationships. What wisdom can we seek from God? And in Jesus Christ, we encounter a God who is love, a God who takes the initiative to love us before we are lovable, 
a God who takes the initiative to do what it takes, even though it's costly to him to offer forgiveness to us. We encounter a God in Jesus Christ who respects our free will that we are created with. It doesn't force himself on us, doesn't force the relationship with us, but allows us to respond and choose. A God who in Jesus Christ called us to repentance, to change hearts and lives. And brothers and sisters, if we embody those things in our relationships, love and forgiveness and mutuality and free will for the other person and repentance, if we do those things, brothers and sisters, we'll be off to a good start. I always take a lot of comfort in the Bible verse that says, insofar as it depends on you, live at peace in all people, with all people. You can only do so far as it depends on you. Here in this passage, Peter and Paul, we have a church meltdown, if you will. I know it's shocking to everybody, but Christians don't always agree on everything and get along with one another and uh, do all the things they ought to do in relationships, right? But here we see one, and we see that Paul is willing to fight, willing to have the hard conversation. That's what hard conversations are, willing, being willing to fight for a relationship. Paul is willing to have the hard conversation to fight for this unity in the church between the Jews and the Greeks, for them to be able to eat at the same table together. For Paul here and for Jesus, the unity, the togetherness, the maintaining the relationships in the church, these are all different words for the same things, the unity, the relationships of the church is not some secondary matter that we work on when we have got all the other things down, but rather unity in the church is a primary thing. It's a primary thing because Jesus, on the night he was going to be betrayed, when he's out in the garden praying, when he's going at one last shot to talk to his disciples, when he knows he's going to die the next day for the sins of the world, Jesus is praying for his disciples that they all might be one. And that by their being one, that the world might know and see who Jesus is. Hmm. It's a witness. The world around us coming to know God's salvation is either helped or hindered by our unity, our relationship with one another. And for Paul, here is of primary importance that he's willing to call out Peter, the guy that Jesus says is the rock the church was going to be built on, because, because they weren't all eating at the same table together anymore. There was a risk that the Gentiles, the majority of the world's population, would be excluded from the table because somebody was trying to please somebody else. Our unity, our relationships with one another are of primary importance because they are key to our witness to the world who so desperately needs to know who Jesus is. This love, this forgiveness, this making right of relationship, this welcome to God's family. Our relationships, our unity are important because through them, Jesus says, the whole world can be changed and saved and made new. Now, no disclaimer once again. We're talking about church here. We're talking about relationships. There are some things that can't or won't be solved by hard conversations, right? There are some situations where there's abuse and violence and crazy folks there. And Jesus says that there are some relationships that because of our faith just aren't going to work out because people won't want to follow him. Hear that. But the unhealthy, the toxic side... The not following Jesus aside, those relationships, and there are so many of them, that break down because we are different, because we're unwilling to have the hard conversations. Well, those, those we can work on. Those we can seek 
Jesus. And we can take it back, like Paul does, to being about Jesus. I've been talking about epic meltdowns, and it's so hard to talk about epic meltdowns in our relationships because we care about other people so much. We are so deeply hurt when they happen. We find it so hard to have the conversations. But sometimes, sometimes meltdowns can really mean that a melt together is possible. Just like Nebuchadnezzar needed his meltdown to get things right with God and to get his life in order. Sometimes meltdowns, like they were for Peter and Paul, can be opportunities to set things straight, to have the hard conversations, to demonstrate love, to come together. You know what else melts down besides relationships and people? Crayons, right? Crayons melt down. They're made out of wax, right? And they're different colors, and they break really easily, and you can only color one color with a crayon unless you melt the crayons down, right? And put them in the oven and they'll melt in those broken pieces you can shape and form them into different shapes that will have different colors in them we have several uh, heart crayons in our house that are made that way and sometimes brothers and sisters these meltdowns that happen can be opportunities that instead of having relationships destroyed instead of disunity can be opportunities for us to melt together into something new something that might look like that heart crayon that's sturdier than the individual crayons and can color in more colors than the original crayon could. Y'all like the preacher's done lost that he's talking about melting crayons. I can see it. But when we seek God, when in our relationship, treble, friend, family, co-worker, church, wherever, whatever, when we take it back to Jesus, when we look at our relationship with God, when we see how God loves us, when we're willing to have the tough conversations, when we're willing to live in peace so far as it depends on us, God just may use our meltdowns like he does for Peter and Paul, who both, by the way, will travel to Gentile Rome and die for their faith and their witness there then we may just be melted together into something stronger, more beautiful, more powerful, a greater and bigger witness for who Jesus is. So, when things start melting down, let us turn our eyes to Jesus, the author, the perfecter of our faith, the one who calls us to be one with him, and with the world, the one who invites us, Jew and Gentile. As Paul will write later on in Galatians, male, female, slave, or free, there is no more because we are one in Christ Jesus and we eat at the one table together. Let us pray. Lord God, forgive us, we pray. Forgive us because we struggle. We live in a society and a culture that has throwaway relationships that tells us to seek our comfort instead of restoration, that it discourages us from having hard conversations and encourages us to pass judgment. We know it's broken, Lord, and so we turn to you. And we look to you, Jesus, to be our model of self-giving love, of forgiveness, of reconciliation, of free will, of grace. And bless that we who are many might be one so that the world might know your salvation. Restore our relationships. Restore us to each other. So that the world might know that in Jesus Christ, their relationship with you, O oh God, can be restored as well. Come, Lord Jesus, meet us at your